It is so good to be standing here. Sandra and I moved to Iowa to be with family. We returned to Columbus to be with family, and you are among our family. And I am so pleased to be standing here and sharing with you this morning. So in our gospel lesson, Jesus' healing of the blind man since birth may be familiar to you. Jesus and his disciples encountered the blind man. The disciples asked him about sin because sin was believed to cause deformity. And Jesus replied that this man's blindness is not about sin, but about revealing God's work in the world. So Jesus spit on the ground, made mud, rubbed the mud on the man's eyes, and sent him off to wash in the pool of Siloam. Enter the Pharisees to challenge the work of Jesus. From John 9. <clears throat> the man who had been blind answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but God does listen to the one who worship, worships and obeys God's will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a blind person, a person born blind indeed. If this, were the, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The Pharisees answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. May light break forth upon God's holy word. Thanks be to God. So in these last weeks, I've read and heard a lot of doublespeak about forgiveness. More and more, it seems like confusing, jibber-jabber. Forgiveness is complicated. It is not hard to understand, but it is surprisingly easy to misunderstand. It requires confession. There is no transgression too big for the forgiveness of God. So lest I add to the confusion, I have just this. As persons created in the image of God, we are called to live in love and mercy. That's all. End of message. <laughs> Nevertheless, I was invited to say more. And as Reverend Tim reminds us, God is in the nevertheless. Please join me in prayer. Oh God, I give thanks for everyone and everything in my life, for every good or ugly experience, for all the times I fall short in thought, word, and deed. Accept my repentance. May all that we say and do today be pleasing to God. In all things, thanks be to God. Amen. So I've, uh, I've shared this story before, but I think it's worth repeating. <laughs> Early in my chap chaplaincy at Nationwide Children's Hospital, I was asked to sit with a teenager who was near the end of his life because of cancer. 
His mother was meeting with nurses from hospice. I knew that, but he did not. I also knew that, that well, at least I thought I knew, <laughs> that I might be more supportive if I could find a connection with him. I believe that when we find our one square foot of common ground, we have the beginning of relationship. So I proceeded to ask questions to find that common ground. I was striking out. His replies were one word, if at all. Finally, he looked me straight in the eye and he said, I don't mean to be rude, but would you please just shut up? <laughs> Ouch! I didn't see that coming because I had not seen him. Our scripture readings challenge us to see as God sees. In looking for a new king to replace Saul, the Lord tells Samuel, the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The taller, stronger sons of Jesse were not suitable, but David had the heart for the job. Journeys of the heart are among the most rugged we will ever face. And in John's gospel, Jesus didn't argue about the cause of the man's blindness. He dismissed the historic belief that suffering is caused by sin. Indeed, he restored the man's sight, but the real miracle was what he did throughout his ministry. He altered the status quo. He challenged the Pharisees to examine their assumptions. Jesus said that those who think they know it all who are unaware of their own blindness, they are truly blind and need help. But those who realize their weakness can become strong. Those who realize their own blindness learn to see. And those who realize their own sin can forgive and be forgiven. The Pharisees were experts in Jewish law, and, and they saw a responsibility to challenge anyone who deviated, deviated from the law. Arrogance, that false sense of self, was blinding them to the presence of God. Jesus was calling for humility to open their eyes to the heart of another and to God. If I don't see you, how can I find our common ground for relationship? How can I forgive or be forgiven? Where will I find emotional resonance that leads to empathy? In his sermon, Love in Action, Martin Luther King preached, forgiveness is not an occasional act, it is a permanent attitude. Let me repeat that. Forgiveness is not an occasional act, it is a permanent attitude. King challenged us to see and act beyond getting even or saving face. Every, every day he did that. He also cautioned us about intellectual and spiritual blindness. The people who crucified Jesus and the people who killed and persecuted persons who are different in color, skin color, culture, or faith are people who do not see the other. King wrote that slavery in America was perpetuated by the blind perception that a system that was economically justifiable, and, excuse me, let me get this right, a system that was economically profitable must be morally justifiable. Early landowners did not see any part of themselves in the Africans that they bought and sold. They saw subhumans. When we do not see the other and we cannot embrace difference, we risk perpetuating injustice. I believe that we are more likely to find authentic forgiveness and rec reconciliation to the extent that we can 
can embody it ourselves. It is a way of life. It is, it is a practice. It is something that comes easily, not, not something that comes easily for many of us. It is complicated. It is a practice to be developed and improved upon throughout our lives. French mystic Jean Vanier outlines three principles of forgiveness that, that might help the practice. First, there can be no forgiveness unless we believe we are part of a common humanity. This means that no one person is superior to, or group is superior to others. We may be different in race, culture, religion, and capacities, but we all have vulnerable hearts, the need to love and be loved, the need to grow and find our place in the world. Each of us has been hurt, and each of us has hurt another. The second principle, to forgive means believing that each of us can evolve and change. It means believing that human redemption is possible without locking anyone into ready-made judgments. Thirdly, to forgive means to yearn for unity and peace. When the father in the parable of the prodigal son and the forgiving father sees his son coming back to him, he rushes out to kiss him. There is no judgment, no disagreeable word, not even, I forgive you. It is just a desire to be in relationship. You know, the, the path to forgiveness may be a journey. I think it is. Before there is forgiveness, there is seeing. You know, how interesting it would be to have eyes with many le lenses like a dragonfly. It might be possible to focus on a single thing and still be aware of the what and the where of other things. When I see a flower, my awareness of the rest of creation fades momentarily. I want to see it all. How can I see it all? Yes, to have eyes like the dragonfly. So when there is forgiveness, or when there is sea and, and a healthy earth, it may be our passion for social justice. You know, in the book of Job, God invites us to look at the paradox of creation, the proud, majestic ostrich that abandons its young, lions that tear apart gazelles, thunderstorms that, that are accompanied by rainbows. God is in all, the beautiful and the ugly. The presence of God is in the one who is wounded and the one who has wounded. To be in relationship with another, my own experience of fear, forgiveness, and love serves as a means of connecting with the pain and the joy of the other. It is where I find our, common, our one square foot of common ground. We are all in this journey together. Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a Zulu word that translates roughly to, I am because of who we all are. Ubuntu reminds me that I am not alone and that I am part of a larger and amazing world. One of Maya Angelou's poems laments, alone, all alone, nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. When I look out upon this congregation, I cannot help but think of the words of the poem and the promises of God to be present to forgive, and to offer courage and assurance for our future. This is my prayer for us. May we have courage to endure what is difficult. May life's challenges bring us closer together. And may we always be able to turn to each other.
May we be filled with spiritual grace. Open our hearts to see God's blessings, the encouragement of our friends, the support of our family, and the bond of love that unites us all. Amen.